Welcome back everyone. In today's video, we're gonna be going over the only two lenses that I use for wildlife photography. I'm making this video today because I get asked camera gear questions quite often. And I wanted to be able to provide you guys with something a little bit more in depth to help answer those questions and hopefully guide you to picking out the right lens or lenses for your wildlife photography. After a decade of shooting different types of lenses and the better part of two years shooting specifically landscape wildlife and outdoor content, I've narrowed down the two lenses that I really, truly bring with me on almost every shoot. Now for you, this may look a little different because our styles of photography might be a little bit different from each other, which could ultimately change the lens type that you choose. My hope for this video though is that by the end of it, you have a better understanding of these lenses and the possible perspectives that you can get by utilizing these lenses in your camera bag. So the two lenses that I use, well, the first one is a 24 to 70 by Canon. It's an L series lens, a 2.8 aperture. And the other one is by Sigma and it's a 150 to 600 millimeter lens. It's the contemporary version and it is a variable aperture zoom lens. Now, how did I come to choose these two lenses as my go-to lenses? Well, I compiled a list of pros and cons and some tips as to when you're using lenses like these and maybe what you could get out of them yourself. Before I get fully into the why, let me explain what a 24 to 70 millimeter lens is. The 24 to 70 is a zoom lens. Simply put, you can zoom in and zoom out on your subject while maintaining your focal point. So what are the pros of this lens? One, it can shoot wide setting the scene that my subject is in. In this photo, you can see the elk. See that it's in the field doing what elks do best. It's in the mountains, it's autumn, and it's foggy outside. When you're shooting with this type of lens, I want the viewer to feel like they're there. Number two, I can create a show of distance between my foreground, midground, and background, giving a full representation of scale. Number three, I can widen the aperture to 2.8. Now, this isn't something that I normally do unless the circumstances are ideal. When you're shooting at a focal point of 2.8, it's a very small focal point. So you want your subject to be almost on the same focal range. So like if I had my shoulders squared off right now, my uh, left shoulder and my right shoulder are pretty much on the same focal range. So I could shoot myself right here at 2.8 and the majority of me will be in focus, if not all of me. But if I'm sideways like this, this part of me at 2.8, you're gonna have fall off, focal fall off. So it's not gonna be as sharp as the front of me if I'm focused here, or if I'm focused on my face right here, I could be maybe out of focus here and a little uh, out of focus here. So when I'm shooting my subject, I usually will choose a higher aperture to get the full subject in focus. But again, if the circumstances allow, my subject is pretty much on the same focal range and I need that extra light, I will widen my aperture down to the 2.8 so that I can get that shot. If not, I'm mostly playing with my shutter speed and my ISO. Number four, it's a light lens. So it's a great addition to have in your backpack for being in the field for long hours or going on long hikes. So what are some of the cons? One, they're generally more expensive when they have a wide aperture like 2.8. They're considered fast lenses. They let in more light. These are usually more expensive lenses. You don't have to get something that shoots at 2.8. You can find lenses that are F4s and they'll be much cheaper. I think this lens itself is around $2,000. So of course, if you're on a budget, maybe look for something that isn't an L series lens. Look for something that is uh, maybe uh, has a more narrower aperture on that lens itself. The second kind of this lens is that a focal range of 24 to 70 is not a whole lot. So you're kind of limited in limiting yourself in the compositions that you can get if your subject is far away you possibly might have to foot zoom and when you're shooting wildlife we aren't always blessed with the possibility to do so especially if they're a dangerous or protected animal you know we want to be saying 50 yards back or more and the last kind that i could think of is if you're shooting wide and your subject is in a very uninteresting environment like say you're shooting a buck and it's walking through the trees or it's kind of hidden behind some bushes or something. You don't really want to shoot wide. That's something you would want to kind of narrow in on and, and get nice and close to kind of block out all that distracting uh, trees and bushes because you don't really need to see all that. At that point, we understand that it's in the woods. But if you're telling a photo story, maybe take a landscape shot 
or if it's close to a clearing, see if it goes out into the clearing and get that wide shot afterwards. But keep an eye out for uninteresting backgrounds. And if you have an uninteresting background that doesn't help or uh, amplify the story, maybe choose a lens or zoom in and get more tight on your subject. So some tips for using a wide to mid-range lens like this would be use it for setting the scene. Get your establishing shot and allow the people who are viewing your images to understand the complete environment that the animal is in that you're shooting. The optical distortion on wide lenses usually allow for the edges to flare out. So let's say you have a mountain in the background and in the mid-ground is your animal. You can actually tilt your lens down, which will stretch that mountain in the background, kind of making it look taller. And now you're playing with the scale of things. So you can also get a little bit more creative with the lens like this. So don't just throw your camera up to your eye, look through the viewfinder and shoot. Maybe play around with the composition and see how that lens distortion can better tell or ampl amplify the story that uh, you're portraying. And also in regards to that, keep an eye out for uninteresting skies. Bright blue skies with nothing going on tend to be negative space. So if you have a lot of negative space in your wide shot, make sure that you're tilting again your lens down, trying to get rid of as much of that negative, uh, unnecessary space in your composition. It's a good thing to remember that everything in your exposure is going to be part of your storytelling element. So when you're composing your subject, make sure that everything in your composition is telling the story you want to tell. What is the main focus here? Is it too busy? Do you have too many things going on all at once? That's the type of stuff to look for. If the sky doesn't help tell the story, then just cut it out. Now for the Sigma 150 to 600 contemporary variable zoom lens. So again, what is a variable zoom lens? For this specific lens, it's why the aperture is five. So if I'm shooting at 150 millimeters, the lowest that I can set the aperture to is five. And then if I zoom in all the way, the lens will automatically adjust the aperture from 5 to 6.3. A more technical way to say this is as you zoom in, the lens automatically limits the amount of light going through the lens by adjusting your aperture. So what are the pros for using this type of lens? One, they're generally cheaper because it's a variable zoom lens. Two, I'm able to get medium shots, close-up shots, and extreme close-up shots. These are all storytelling elements. Remember, when we're taking photos, we're telling a story. It's just like shooting video, but you only have one frame to tell the story. So a medium shot explains who the subject is. This is essentially a medium shot, what you're seeing now. You know I'm the subject and I'm talking to you guys. There's not really a whole lot else distracting going on, except I have this thing in the background and some stuff in the foreground. Close-up shots and extreme close-up shots get really tight in on the subject and showing you more intimate details and characteristics showing you what the real identity of what you're looking at is. These are the storytelling shots that engage the viewers by bringing them and the subject closer together by showing you the fine details and characteristics that identify the subject for who they are. The third pro is that telephoto and super telephoto lenses like this one, this brings everything closer. This allows for a more interesting background that can either add to the story you're trying to tell or help get rid of distractions in your background. These lenses have a lot of different pieces of glass in them to get you that entire focal range. And for every piece of glass that is in this lens, light has to travel through it, possibly risking a softer image. Also, anything over 400 millimeters, you're gonna start running into possible atmospheric distortion what is atmospheric distortion? Think about seeing asphalt on a really hot day and you can see the heat kind of rising up off of the asphalt. That is atmospheric distortion. So depending on the weather conditions that you're shooting in, if you're shooting over 400 millimeters, you might be running into that and might uh, be risking catching a soft photo then too. And this is why my photography teachers always said the foot zoom is the best. So if you can risk getting closer to your subject, you know, take precautions and maybe walk a little bit closer, but don't put yourself in a position where you're making the animal feel threatened. Be sure to stay safe out there. Number two, they're much heavier because of all the extra pieces of glass and parts that are inside these lenses. And that is why I only carry these two lenses with me. With my camera body and that lens alone, we are over 13 pounds. 
So that's a lot of weight to have in my camera bag, plus another lens and my filmmaking stuff. So I'm carrying a lot of weight on me. Again, this is why it's important to figure out what you're shooting and how what your shooting style is so you can limit the amount of gear that you're bringing with you. Number three, due to their weight, they're much harder to shoot handheld. You are gonna have a hard time stabilizing the camera handheld. You're either gonna have to god pod, which is just like curling in on yourself and using your knees, or you're gonna need a tripod. Which brings us to number four, because of how hard they are to shoot uh, handheld and how hard it is to stabilize the camera, make sure that you get yourself a tripod that can bear the weight of your camera body and the lens that you buy. Lastly, number five, because these are a variable aperture lens, it is very important that you compose your subject before you expose your subject. If you expose your subject before you compose uh, for the shot that you want to take, you might find that you have all the settings complete for the perfect exposure, go and zoom in, and you were at a five, you know, five aperture, and now you've zoomed in and you're at 6.3. Now your photo's too dark and you missed the shot that you wanted, and now your animal has run away. So make sure that you are composing everything first and then adjust your settings. This won't really be an issue if you're shooting at a time of day where you have plenty of light, but if you're shooting in a scenario where it's either like golden hour times or twilight, then you wanna make sure that you are composing and then exposing. So a few tips for using this lens. Again, just be mindful of uh, what the outcome of your photo is gonna be. Think about your shot before you take it so that again, you can compose and then expose. And then just make sure when you're buying the gear that you pick out a tripod that is gonna be one, comfortable to carry around you on hikes and in the field. Two, is gonna stabilize the weight of your camera and the lens of your choice. And three, is easily adjustable so that you can uh, pick out the composition that you want or if you wanna shoot in landscape or portrait mode. So let me touch on teleconverters real quick. I personally do not use teleconverters at all and I recommend you don't either. Now some people are gonna recommend that you do. Uh, I know some people who use them and love them and maybe if you were shooting with maybe a, like a Canon 300 millimeter prime, something that is a solid piece of glass and you can afford to put another piece of glass between your lens and your sensor, then by all means, you can take that risk. But for me, someone who's using uh, variable zoom lenses or variable aperture uh, zoom lenses and zoom lenses, I don't wanna put a teleconverter there because there's already so many pieces of glass in those lenses. And for every piece of glass, I create more risk of creating a softer image. And the name of the game here is to create sharp images. So I would rather crop in post than throw a teleconverter on and risk possibly not even getting a good shot. If you found this video helpful, please consider giving this video a like. If you enjoy content like this, think about subscribing as I have a lot more videos coming your way in 2022. For the gear I use, more information, where you can hike along with me on social media, be sure to check out the description. Also, sorry about my light dying again. My coworkers took my other RGB and that was all I had and a full battery lasted me 11 minutes. And if you wish to share anything, add what you liked, add what you didn't like, please be sure to leave a comment below. I'll be sure to get back to you and all those critiques do help me provide better content for you guys in the future. Thanks everybody and I'll see you guys in the next one.